although poor Noah was a bit under the weather, possibly because of this, uh, these uh, tributes they have been offering to the gods. Uh, today's uh, topic is on rock art, and of course uh, our friend Noah is uh, affiliated with us at the Archaeology Unit at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies. He is actually really a, a PhD candidate with Australian National University. Uh, I've known Noah for some time now, I think we were just chatting about it, it's almost 10 years. He first appeared on one of our sites at, at uh, St. Andrew's Cathedral. Back then, still uh, a bit uh, of a young man, now I guess he's grown up. Uh, and he helped us with several other sites, uh, and I believe you were my, my research assistant at, at Sarapong, uh, uh, Fort, Fort Tanjong Katong, and uh, Palmer Road. So he's been involved with, on and off with archaeology over the years. And he has surprisingly taken on, a, 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 I wouldn't say deviation, but he has surprisingly taken on onto one route which is very rarely explored in the wonderful world of archaeology, a very obscure corner called rock art. What exactly is rock art, uh, he will tell us, of course, uh, but of course if you want to expand the definition, it could be anything from paint works on uh, rock or carvings or even epigraphy. Uh, rock art, of course, in the Malayan um, archipelago is, is, is quite a recent phenomenon in terms of discovery. I think if I'm, my memory serves me, correct me if I'm wrong, no, uh, uh, it was only in the 1920s, I think, when, in Malaya itself, when they, they uncovered quite a few things in Perak itself. Uh, I think it was uh, IHN Evans who found some of the things up at uh, Lengong, right? Lengong, uh, Lengong, of course, in Perak is very famous for it. He found some of these rock art. But surprisingly, the rock art that he discovered were of modern nature. He discovered that the, the Aboriginals, or Orang Asli, as you, if you may, were painting uh, 20th century motor cars and bicycles <laughs> and elephants and things like that. But still, in a sense, it was rock art. Uh, it only took possibly, at least in the Malayan Peninsula itself, uh, uh, possibly up to the post-war period when people like Barbara uh, Henderson, Harris, Harrison, Barbara and Tom Harrison, who worked up in, in of course, you know the Nia caves, the popular ones like that. And uh, other discoveries again in Perak, particularly the Kinta Valley, that they found all these uh, rock art, uh, perhaps of an earlier date. So they're, they're varying dates with it, and as probably with what Ivan's found in 1926 or 25, that rock art continues all the way to the modern, uh, the modern period of motor cars and stuff. Uh, but I guess you're not here to listen to me go rumble, rumble about what my impression of rock art is. In fact, I know very little about it. Uh, I should pass the floor to uh, Noel, who has a very exciting topic <laughs> titled Same Same But Different, uh, The Rock Art of Southeast Asia. Please welcome him. I see uh, some pictures on there. And, and how I got into rock art was towards the end of my undergrad days, I, I stumbled on um, this article in the journal Man about the Guantanamo site and I decided to take a road trip up, uh, just outside of Ipoh, very accessible. And it was a spectacular sight, and so, so little was known about it. So I figured, let's, let's try and do uh, something about that, and, and how much we don't actually know about the rock art of, of Southeast Asia is actually quite, quite incredible, and how much rock art of, uh, there is in Southeast Asia is also quite incredible. And for this next hour, I'm going to bring you on this uh, whirlwind tour of uh, Southeast Asia. And so, uh, for my presentation, it's probably two parts. First, I want to give you an overview of the rock art of Southeast Asia, um, what is out there, how it's studied, uh, what we can do about it, and then I want to talk a little bit about my own uh, PhD research, which is about uh, the conjunction of rock art sites and sacred spaces uh, in uh, mainland Southeast Asia. Um, just a warning, uh, at some point of this presentation, there will be a depiction of a dead baby, and if you are uncomfortable with such depictions, I'll tell you beforehand and you can avert your eyes. Other than that, um, there shouldn't be any other shocking pictures in this presentation. So <laughs> when we think about rock art, um, what, what, what do we, what we think, what comes to mind? Perhaps it's the Lascaux Caves in France, or um, if anyone has watched uh, Werner Herzog's 3D documentary that came out two years ago, I don't believe it came out in, in Singapore at all, uh, which was a big shame, but King of Forgotten Dreams was an amazing film. Um, watching it on 3D really felt like you were walking through a cave. You look at the same tingles as uh, someone walking through a cave. And there was the Chauvet Caves in France. Other famous rock art sites, uh, close, closer to home, are the ones in Australia. 
This is a um, uh, painted hand sign from uh, the Red Lily Billabong, um, um, which is dateable. This was only drawn about 80 years ago, and uh, the, the grandson of the drawer uh, still was able to talk to us about the history of this, of this painting. Um, <coughs> I the question, um, how well do we know neighbors? What kind of uh, famous rock art sites are there in Southeast Asia? Um, anybody? No? No? What do we know about the rock art sites? Uh, what do we know about rock art sites of Southeast Asia? Um, if you're hard pressed to think of a reason or, or examples, uh, let's start reviewing some of the literature that's out there. Um, so, uh, recent overviews of Southeast Asian rock art. Um, back prior to the 1980s, there's only a handful of rock art sites in the world. Uh, the ones that Chen mentioned, we have the uh, Orang Asli sites in, in uh, Perak. We've got the Gua Tambun, uh, Gua Kain Hitam in Nia, um, uh, Van Hikiran. What about some rock art sites in Indonesian islands? We have the Patalan Caves in Myanmar. We also have one very obscure reference to a rock art site in southern Thailand. Uh, uh, written in the 1920s, and that's about, yeah, literally a handful of sites that we know about uh, before 1980. And in 1987, there was this uh, big seminar by the uh, SPAFA, the Southeast Asian uh, Ministers of Education Organization project in fine arts and archaeology. Uh, they had a big seminar in 1987 about the, the prehistory of uh, Southeast Asia, and they concluded that on the subject of rock art, there isn't much rock art in Southeast Asia, number one, and it's too hard to interpret, so let's not talk about them anymore. And that's, <coughs> that's quite sad. Uh, in 1994, uh, in a book about world rock art, written by an Italian, Emmanuel Adati, uh, this was his map of uh, rock art of the world. And I draw your attention to the big gap in Southeast Asia. <coughs> Nothing that we know about in Southeast Asia. Uh, eight years later, we have uh, John claude a famous uh, French rock art expert. And for his book, entitled also World Rock Art, we have one example uh, from Rock Art, uh, from Borneo, uh, who was discovered by another Frenchman. So uh, just kind of cheating um, and kind of sad too. In 2001, um, there's a book called The Handbook of Rock Art Research. It's just uh, really a handbook that's like way thick. And if you throw it at somebody, you'll probably kill him. Um, Southeast Asia comes under three pages of text uh, in the chapter on um, um, Asia, and it's all about the, the, the past handful of sites that I mentioned, all written in the 1980s. So very sad. Um, <coughs> Peter Bellwood and Ian Glover's uh, textbook on Southeast Asian archaeology writes that um, compared to Australia, we have very little rock art, which is technically true because Australia has thousands and thousands of rock art sites. Um, so yeah, but that's all that's written about rock art in, in this textbook. Um, any of you who is familiar with uh, archaeological literature would have seen this scale. IFRAO actually means International Federation of Rock Art Organizations, of which Southeast Asia has no representation inside. Which is sad, we've got a Chinese rock art organization, an Indian rock art organization, but um, nowhere in Southeast Asia is represented in the International Federation of Rock Art Organizations. And still, <coughs> all over Southeast Asia, people use the IFRAO scale. Just third bit of a laugh. So when you read about uh, these large overviews of Southeast Asia and rock art, you come to two, two conclusions, two attitudes. First, rock art is not worth researching. And secondly, <coughs> there's not a lot of rock art in Southeast Asia. But is that really true? Is that really the case? I mean, when you consider that Southeast Asia is across, the crossroads of India, the crossroads of China, the crossroads of um, Australia, all three major rock art uh, regions is it even remotely possible that we don't have rock art in Southeast Asia, or there's very little rock art in Southeast Asia? Uh, in fact, and this is, my, this is my very incomplete cursory map of Southeast Asia, there's about five to 600 sites uh, in Southeast Asia alone, and distribution is not, uh, not even, but just to explain this map a bit, um, red sites are red painting sites, black sites, uh, mostly in Malaysia, are black charcoal, presumably charcoal painting sites, Blue sites are petroglyph sites, and <coughs> larger dots represent clusters, and smaller dots represent single sites. Uh, and it's an incomplete map. So um, most of the work in Waka, uh, in this region has been done in Thailand, and most of the literature is written in Thai, which is why we don't really know a lot about um, 
the, the, the sites that we know of, but Thailand is something like uh, 400 sites. So if Thailand has 400 sites, it's impossible for Myanmar to have only four sites. It's impossible for Laos to have only five sites. It's impossible for Cambodia to have only 12 sites. It's just, it's just not possible. Um, so what is Roca? And I'll bring you back to the, the first slide that I had uh, running before the lecture started. Um, this was from a workshop on um, rock art studies that was just held last year. Um, sometime last year, SPAFA decided to have a, a seminar on rock art studies. They, they, they realized that, hey, wait a minute, there's a lot more rock art that we have here. Let's call everybody down and have a, have a seminar to talk about what rock art is. And until this form was put up, um, half of these countries did not have a name for rock art. So, so this, this is like the birth of terminology of rock art talk in Southeast Asia. And, um, and, and there's some interesting translations too, because say the Malaysian to Kisangua and um, the Thai Silapatam both translate to uh, paintings in caves or drawings in caves. Cambodian Kamnu uh, Lo means uh, artwork slash decoration on stone or rock. So they're not, not precise uh, terminologies. There is a precise terminology in English according to the Ephraim definition, which you can read there, I'm not going to read it out. But I just want to raise several salient points. Um, first, when we talk about rock art, we're not talking about art in the aesthetic sense. We are talking about um, non-utilitarian activity. It, almost, almost the same way how parents would tell their kids, don't take an arts degree because it's non-utilitarian. Um, <laughs> That kind of sense. Um, um, but another big, big uh, thing about rock art is, uh, another big perspective that we take in rock art is uh, landscape. There are markings essentially on a landscape, uh, which is also not really true because there are examples of portable rock art, but by and large rock art is portable. And when we talk about rock art, we talk about three uh, general uh, categories of rock art. Pictograms, uh, which are paintings, um, and essentially, uh, uh, rock art where something is applied to rock surface, uh, carvings, uh, a process where the rock is removed from the surface, and um, megaliths where it's a kind of landscape art where, where entire rocks are moved into a surface, into a place. And we have examples of all three in Southeast Asia. So for paintings, uh, this is a, a brilliant segment of an 80 meter panel in uh, Aten in Thailand. It's a, it's a cliff face uh, right at the edge of uh, Thailand. It faces the Mekong River and across that is Lao. And there are, there's a cliff side on the other side that probably has paintings but no one has gone over to, to see. Um, mostly because uh, it's really hard to, to do research on the Lao border for, for various sensitive reasons. But you can see depictions of, um, let's see, fish, uh, turtle, and these are possibly depictions of human beings. Um, and I don't really know the archaeology of this site uh, very well to, to talk about, but yeah, I visited it last year, it was spectacular. Um, for a long time, we didn't know any rock art in Java and Sumatra, and it was a big, it was a big question about, uh, is, this a, is this a distribution pattern that we, that we don't know about? And then, lo and behold, in 2007, 2008, uh, we have the first example of uh, rock art, rock paintings found in Sumatra, and that's that's uh, overturned our our whole uh, idea about distributions of rock art in Southeast Asia. Um, back in Borneo, uh, any Malaysians here? No, happy Malaysia, oh, happy Malaysia. Goa Kain Hitam in the Nia Cave complex. Um, it's quite famous for the rock art. You can see, um, if you look at this and compare to the old uh, um, photographs that Harrison produced in the 1960s, you see a, a, a large degree of degradation. You see LDA starting to creep up onto the rock wall. <coughs> it's a shame. Um, uh, Nia Chase, of course, are famous for having the, the oldest um, skull fragment of anatomically modern humans and that's just been supplanted by uh, a find in Lao. Um, but yes, the Goa Kain Hitam is known for the Ship of the Dead paintings. It's associated with boat coffins. Um, and you can see some of that in a bit. Uh, when it comes to carvings, one of the most famous petroglyph sites that we have in Southeast Asia is uh, the Sapa engraved rock field. 
and I hear that that site is under uh, in danger now because they're going to build a dam near the site, and there's there's a uh, there's a real fear of um, of flooding to some of these sites, and and it's a spectacular site. Uh, it's about a, an overnight trip from Hanoi, uh, and you've got loads of uh, about 184 boulders that have been carved, uh, what appear to be rice terraces, but also human figures, uh, weapons as well. And uh, it's still a farmland, so what you see this yellow, th yellow, yellow thing is actually uh, rice that's being dried on the, on the boulder. Um, in Cambodia, we have the famous uh, Cabal Spian carvings. Um, technically, Roca, these are carvings on a landscape. And um, this, this is part of a, a complex called the River of a Thousand Lingers. Um, and it's been studied by a great deal by, by art historians and, and our French colleagues in Angkor. And I don't want to steal the thunder, but technically it's Roca. It is, it is uh, carvings on a, on a landscape. And, and I think what, what sets uh, Rock art researchers apart from, from say, the epigraphists and uh, the art historians is that we are looking at, at, a, at a landscape point of view. So on that technical note, Singapore has a rock art site. Mm -hmm. Singapore stone is technically rock art. I mean, it was inscribed on a boulder uh, which stood at the mouth of the Singapore River. And um, you know, we have inscribed stones um, that, are, that are located all along the streets of Malacca. It's, it's just a shame that it was blown up and now we just only have fragments of it. But um, the difference between an epigraphist and a rock art researcher is that we'd be looking at displacement and landscape to tell us about um, um, who were they addressing, were they uh, even the orientation of this of this stone was it was it facing inland was it facing outwards who was the audience for the people reading the stone and that might inform us about uh, settlement patterns within uh, within the immediate area. Uh, the last task of Rock is of course megaliths, and we don't really usually think of them as such. Um, but usually the rocks formed in uh, formation. These are a replica of a megalithic complex found in the Greece of Milan. Um, we think of megaliths or landscape art, we think of Stonehenge, uh, the Nazca Lines in Peru. We've got some of them in, in uh, Southeast Asia too. <coughs> the most famous of which is the Plain of Jars in Laos. Um, um, the mysterious plane of jars and all, and um, there's some mysterious that I won't say anything else about it. Um, this, uh, these are crocodile mounds, and they're pretty hard to see, but I'll, I'll point it out to you. This is the body of the crocodile, and these are the legs over here, and there are two mounds over here. The crocodile mounds were um, built uh, by the Lun Bawan in Sarawak, and they were, um, they were commemorations to warriors, um, and that practice uh, quickly died out uh, when Christianity arrived. But uh, archaeologically speaking, they're, they're a signature for longhouses. If you find uh, if you find a crocodile mound, you're sure to find a longhouse within the immediate area. So there, there are very um, tangible archaeological uh, signatures associated with megaliths, uh, such as crocodile mounds. Now. Um, <coughs> Part of the reason we are so behind about rock art studies is um, there's a linguistic difference. Um, most of the studies that have come out in the last 20, 30 years have been in smaller journals, uh, regional journals, non-English journals. Um, they also, rock art tends to be less sexy than temples. Um, you, can't, you can't bring rock art back to you in the lab. You can't take out the cave and, and, and exhibit it. Um, so we tend to be ignored. Quite, quite a bit, and a lot of the, the past approaches to watch rock art have, have really just been image-based approaches. So we're looking at that. I think it's a cow, therefore it's a cow. Here's a picture of a cow, um, um, which is which is uh, yeah, which is that. It's not, uh, and we do really have a lot of different ways to analyze rock art now. Um, for the rest of this presentation, I'm only just going to really talk focus on. Uh, rock art as paintings, and I'm not really going to talk so much about uh, megaliths and, and carvings um, because paintings is what we usually think about when we talk about rock art. Um, so, recording remains a really important part of uh, rock art research. Um, you need a good record in order to get a good data set. So, the bottom right picture is from uh, a recording of uh, pact inscriptions in uh, Della Monica in Spain. Uh, tracing petroglyphs, and the other two pictures are 
uh, tracing of rock paintings in Thailand. Um, I have to say that, that this isn't uh, an approved way of uh, mm -hmm. recording rock art anymore. Uh, there's a danger of, of course, the direct contact with the paintings uh, pigment flaking off. Um, if you notice, uh, this lady here, she's holding a bag full of face powder, and she is powdering the the uh, the surface of the rock to get the impression of the petroglyph, which is quite horrific now. But 20 years ago, it was the norm. Uh, the, the 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 sad thing is that all Thai sites have been recorded this way, and, and this has. Um, real implications for how we, we analyze rock art pigments in, in the future. Um, for, for, uh, for now, we're looking at towards um, non-invasive methods, and that almost always means photography and sketching. Uh, this, this is for my MA research. Um, this is me. Uh, this is Guatambo, and it's about a uh, 10 meter drop. And, and we spent two weeks just uh, looking at the cliff face and identifying every single one, every single painting, putting them on, on forms, and then, um, so very high resolution recording. Every single, uh, uh, this single rock outside was divided into panels, sub-panels, and then individual elements. Um, also, for this year, I've been experimenting with uh, slightly more high-tech versions of recording rock art. So I'm using the iPad, using the iPhone, uh, at, in place of paper forms, which really helps with uh, carrying, in, instead of carrying hundreds of forms, I carry just one iPad or one phone. Uh, one phone. And of course, digital photography has greatly dropped the, the, the cost of doing rock art research. Um, I can go out the site and take 6,000 photos. Uh, 6,000 photos translates to about 166 rolls of film and the processing. Uh, that, that's just not within the budget to process that kind of uh, film. And you can do that now because digital is so much cheaper. Um, and also with digital photography comes the, the uh, ability to use digital enhancements, which are also non-invasive. And, and the great thing about digital enhancements is that you can start seeing things that uh, you couldn't see before. So you can't see this now, but with digital enhancement you can start seeing uh, paintings that weren't was really, really faint and you couldn't see clearly. And, and that, that segues to um, a side project that I worked on uh, when I was in uh, Cambodia earlier this year. Uh, I found paintings in Angkor Wat that no one has seen before. And in fact, you're one of the first people to, to see it. Um, uh, you can't really see it here. You can see just the uh, really faint paintings. Uh, and this is because there's a flash. Uh, it's flash photography. So imagine this without any, any light, and you, you practically will not see what we're seeing here. Uh, depictions of uh, buildings, boats, uh, complex scenes. Some of the most complex scenes occur on the highest level of Angkor Wat. So uh, you might see something here on the, oops, you might see something here on the left, uh, a little gong. The entire scene looks like this. Uh, this is a de depiction of a It's a uh, it's a, a, a gong orchestra, uh, very similar to the Kamelan. So we have the, the xylophones. Uh, this over here is a stralai, uh, which is an oval. Um, the comic to the, the sunai. Also, uh, take note of this register of uh, this diamond floral pattern. That's, that's, uh, that's, it's not just vandalism. This is a, a deliberate attempt to, to draw something here, a very complex scene. Again, on the top level of Angkor Wat, you have, uh, you can't see it here, but it looks like this, an amazing uh, 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 scene, and I'm, I'm asking my historians about what they look like. So, um, with, with uh, digital enhancements, you get, you get a real sense of, uh, you get access to images that you can't see anymore. So with the, the site at Gura Tambu, where I worked at for my masters, um, when, when I first started out, the, the estimates in the literature was 80 to 100 paintings. Because of a uh, high resolution recording, I had 640 images after that. So 600 percent, you know, that's, that's an amazing um, uh, data set that can be looked at. Uh, and looking to the future, we're looking at uh, tree recording. And this is a very exciting field uh, that's, that's moving very fast even now. 
So this is a sculpture outside uh, my library in ANU. And the one, the, the image below is uh, a tree rendering that I did using open source software. Uh, it took me 800 photos to do and two days of processing on the computer. Now, that's just last year. This year, I did the same thing with this site um, using my iPad, using 17 photos and half an hour processing. So that's how fast the technology has changed in a span of one year. Um, and it will come to a point, I predict this quite, quite confidently, that you'll be able to do this from your phone in five years, simple. And that has really, really uh, amazing implications for the way we record sites. Uh, um, which, I mean, archaeologists have to fight for money all the time, but if we can make the technology cheaper, there's no reason we can't record sites. Um, ethnography is another uh, aspect of rock art research um, that is not tapped on so much in Southeast Asia. In Australia, we have worked a couple of times, we've had really good um, uh, informants, uh, and I've learned with ethnography, it's not as simple as it seems. Um, so, uh, this is us talking to a traditional owner about the meaning of this, of this site. But there's so many layers involved in talking to traditional owners. He might, if you're a stranger, he might only give you access to one part of the story. If you're his brother or sister, he might give you another aspect. If you're his poison cousin, he might, give you a, uh, he might not talk to you at all. And in some ways, it's, it's very informative. In other ways, um, I feel really happy that we don't have to deal with this so much in Southeast Asia. Um, um, but again, uh, many of the sites in Southeast Asia are associated with prehistoric hunter-gatherer populations and it makes sense to start talking to indige indigenous populations about uh, what this rock art is. I mean, we look at a rock art and we say this is a cow, this is a tapir, this is a rhino, but uh, would the locals see the same things in the same way? Uh, and, and that's something that uh, in Southeast Asia we don't do a lot of engagement with, we don't do a lot of engagement with indigenous peoples and this is Southeast Asia where we don't have a really good record of dealing fairly with indigenous peoples as well. But uh, this picture is from uh, a site I was working on earlier this year and it's, uh, it's a temple site. There's um, boundary stones on the outside and I was talking to the abbot of the, of the Wat and he was telling me about the history of the Wat and the history of the, the boundary stones and then I asked him, so what's about the history of the rock art? And he looked at me, what rock art? And I have to tell him, okay, come on, come with us. We'll show you the rock art. And he, 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 he even didn't know himself that there was rock art in, in his compound. So that's quite interesting. 